Moloele Mzans Africa, as we prepare to close out our second week under level four lockdown, we discuss how national government's ineffective regulations and inadequate vaccination program are pushing families deeper into unemployment and poverty. Lockdowns are literally killing us, particularly those employed in sectors like hospitality who find themselves once again shut out of the economy with little to no support. We'll unpack the full impact of rolling lockdowns and why they are not the solution to bringing COVID-19 under control. But first, we take a look at the week in headlines. Africa's last absolute monarchy is in crisis. Demonstrators now calling for an end to what they say is a tyrannical rule of King Mswati III and his government. Some protests have turned violent and the army has now been deployed. Political activists and civil society groups have also called on the international community to intervene in the hope of creating a democratic system in Eswatini. The backlog in vaccination coupled with the Delta variants high and quick transmission is of great concern. It might take more than two years to vaccinate just 20 million people at the rate we're going. I feel as if South African government is the only government that doesn't respect their healthcare workers. We're seeing over other countries that they're giving their tax exemptions, they're getting recognized for it. We are not. KwaZulu Natal's economy is under threat. The mining giant Richards Bay Minerals had to shut down operations over escalating violence in surrounding communities. It's yet another day in court for former President Jacob Zuma. Former President Jacob Zuma's urgent application for a stay of his arrest pending his application in the Constitutional Court next week will meanwhile be heard in the High Court in Peter Maritzburg today. Please have until tomorrow to arrest Zuma. But the former president wants the constitutional court judgment and order that sentenced him to be rescinded. This week in the headlines, as the midnight deadline to arrest Zuma looms large, will Begitzela follow through? More South Africans are infected by COVID-19, while government only vaccinates 3% of its target. And three years later, we still don't know the economic cost of amending Section 25 of the Constitution. But first, mining giant Rio Tinto Group is shutting down its operations in Richards Bay. Why? Because of escalating violent crimes in the area that saps cannot control. This follows Clover moving out of Lichtenberg due to poor service delivery and Omar Rusk factory in Maltino wants to do the same. These moves represent thousands of local jobs lost and billions of investments pouring out of these communities. By contrast, Amazon has chosen to build its South African headquarters in Deiran, Western Cape, bringing with it 19,000 jobs and 4 billion rand to the local economy. It proves that where the DA governs, we get things done. The land expropriation bill continues to fundamentally threaten the rights of every single South African. Should the bill be passed, our already desperate economy will likely collapse. Businesses will flee South Africa, taking jobs with them, and banks will stop granting loans as title deeds will become virtually worthless. The DA has requested Parliament to conduct a full impact assessment on the devastating consequences we would face should this disastrous piece of legislation become law. The DA will not allow the ANC and the EFF Coalition of Corruption to undermine the property rights of all South Africans. The escalating situation in Eswatini should disturb us all. Thousands of citizens have been calling for important democratic reforms and government has responded with violence. Thus far, at least 20 people have been killed. The DA has called on International Relations Minister Naledi Pando to act with the SADC to initiate pro-democracy talks between the Kingdom of Eswatini and all political parties. Quiet diplomacy is not an option when human rights are being violated and the South African government should know better. This past weekend, only 20,000 people were vaccinated. That's only 10,000 people per day when government's own target is 300,000 daily. 
That is pathetic. The Department of Health is blaming this criminally slow vaccine rollout to the lack of overtime budget for vaccination staff to work over weekends. But this is simply not good enough. The ANC-led government should be prioritizing support to our heroic frontline workers and doing everything in their power to enable speedy vaccine rollout. Let's step up to save lives seven days a week. And now the main news of the past week, Police Minister Begitzele has until tonight to arrest constitutional delinquent Jacob Zuma if he does not hand himself over to the SAPs. Tsele now has a choice of whether he's going to side with the constitution and the rule of law or with the convicted criminal Jacob Zuma. Meanwhile, President Ramaphosa has been in hiding. No one knows where he is, saying nothing to condemn Zuma's antics over the weekend where he gathered thousands in Nganja with no regard for COVID protocols. Is he in agreement with the ANC's NEC statement yesterday that they love Zuma and that they hope that he wins his case? It is now time for justice to take its course. Zuma must just go to jail. Moving on to the spotlight feature this week, lockdown is killing South Africa. It is a blunt tool that simply must end. Today, we take a look at why and survey the complete devastation it has brought on South Africans and their families. Let's take a look at this story in the spotlight. It's been a debate since the dawn of the coronavirus lockdowns, lives versus livelihoods. For the next two weeks, many sectors undoubtedly going to be badly affected. COVID-19 restrictions have had a devastating impact on many businesses and has left our economy on its knees. The sale of alcohol is prohibited for at least the two next weeks, could be longer. Another blow for the restaurant industry, the president announcing that establishments will only be allowed to sell takeaways over the next two weeks. If anybody really understood our business and had ever worked in a restaurant, they'd understand that to remodel the business costs money. And we've come from 14 months of carrying accumulated debt that we're still trying to pay off. And the beautiful people who work in our industry are vulnerable. They again are now going to have to be put on unpaid layoff and it stands a chance again of 500, 600,000 people potentially losing their jobs. The reality is that people will not be able to pay their bills, they will not be able to feed their children. We are trying by all means to, 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 to feed our children. I feel uh, Mr. President is really not doing justice to us. Almost 250,000 people are not going to go to work tomorrow. The president is going to go to work with his cabinet. That has no clue what is happening on the ground because they live in high chairs. We feel laid down by this government that continues to ignore the plight of our people. It has been 15 months since the very first lockdown was announced last year in order to buy time for government to build a health system capacity, an act that would help us deal with the first wave of COVID-19 infections. The DA supported these measures because we wanted to make sure that no South African goes without a hospital bed, access to life-saving oxygen, and no healthcare worker is unable to do their work because of a broken health system. Instead, our government has spent the past year moving the country between lockdown levels without a vaccination program to speak of, while presiding over the absolute destruction of our economy, which was already hanging on its thread. Businesses which employ thousands of people have been forced to shut down their doors without any government assistance to help them keep their employees in their jobs. The Disaster Management Act, which is making it possible for national government to impose a lockdown and irrational bans with zero accountability, stands to become one of the grossest violations of human rights in its human rights in democratic South Africa, thanks to the sheer scale of the devastation it has brought. Lockdowns are not a solution to beating this pandemic. The only way we can ensure that we survive COVID-19 is an effective vaccine rollout plan where the most vulnerable are prioritized and as many South Africans are vaccinated urgently. But this has not happened. South Africa currently ranks 166th in the world for its vaccine rollout, behind even countries like Zimbabwe and Somalia. 
South Africans have been made to pay for government's gross negligence. And this is why the Democratic Alliance has called for a comprehensive parliamentary inquiry into government's handling of the vaccine program. There must be accountability for this failure, which has cost thousands of lives and livelihoods. To discuss all of this and more, we joined in studio by DA Chief Whip Natasha Mazzoni, the Shadow Minister of Employment and Labor, Dr. Michael Cardo, and on Zoom, constitutional and public law expert Martin von Staden, Shadow Minister for Trade and Industry, De Dean McPherson, and the owner of a local uh, bar in Cape Town, Yobo Sivu Nobo. Hello, everybody, and uh, good morning. Let's jump right into it, uh, Tasha. I know that we've got a lot to cover. Natasha, we hear a lot about the use of the Disaster Management Act. It was first enacted uh, last year, and now it has been almost 16 months under the disaster management. And the reality is that it keeps getting exp extended and extended. What are some of the implications that we've seen with the, with, with the imposition of this act? Well, I think the biggest thing that South Africans need to realize is that this act is intended to be used for short bursts of time when mm. there is a short-term disaster that South Africa can deal with uh, very quickly and very fast. It certainly wasn't intended to be an act that is simply uh, goes on at, at infinitum as it is at the moment. With uh, What we've done essentially is we've created a prime minister. So we have a country where we have President Ramaphosa and Prime Minister NDZ. And uh, quite frankly, what it does is it takes essentially away the power of parliament and the president away and it puts a massive amount and an equal amount of power in the hands of the Minister of Local Government and uh, Traditional Affairs, mm. which is in Kozazana Glamini Zuma. Mm. So effectively, when people want to blame what's going on, we must place the blame where it's necessary, at the President for allowing someone to usurp his power, and with our Prime Minister, mm. who shouldn't be there, mm. uh, NDZ, who is now at will, simply extending the Act. And what makes me laugh is the Act is extended at midnight, mm. and we simply wake up the next morning to find that the Act has been extended for another month. But also, uh, Natasha, the other issue here is that, as you said, as you mentioned briefly, is that it usurps the powers of parliament. So this act gives sort of unvetted powers to the executive without any form of accountability or oversight. Absolutely. Um, so that's why I say it's designed for short bursts. Yeah. It's designed for an absolute emergency that's easily containable, that parliament wouldn't require to come in and do oversight over. With a, with a pandemic such as COVID, it will go on. We don't know how long it will go on for. But but what we do know is that we, the, the president has now allowed a minister to usurp the power of parliament. And it's very difficult for parliament to now call a sitting of parliament because in actual fact, we should be holding her to account mm. and her department to account. But she's stopping that happening because of the powers and the limitations that she puts in accordance to the act. Yeah. Michael, I want to come to you. Um, there has been a lot of uh, talk around the UIF and the TERS benefits and essentially the mess that has ensued over the past year and a half. If you had to explain to somebody what has gone on, what would you say? Well, the fact is that TERS was started last year at the end of March and it was meant initially for a three-month period. For April, May and June, 40 billion rand was set aside. What ended up happening was that the lockdowns got extended and TERS got extended too. So in the end, TERS ran from April last year, the beginning of April last year, to the 15th of March this year. Now we found ourselves in level four lockdown regulations and of course people can't work, they can't earn their full income. So the government has given an in principle agreement to reinstate TERS for the period of the level four lockdown regulations. We haven't had an official announcement about that yet. We should hear it after cabinet meets today. And hopefully what we will see is that all the people who can't get to work or who can't earn their full income because of the level four lockdown regulations will be covered by TERS. That's the DA's central point. If the government prevents you from working, then it must come to the party with relief measures. TERS, unfortunately, has been very, very problematic for the mm. period that it has been run. There's been lots of fraud and corruption. Dead people have got TERS. Prisoners have got TERS. People with non-existent ID numbers have got TERS. There's been an investigation by the Auditor General to find out exactly what went wrong. 
and we wait to find out exactly what disciplinary measures are going to be taken against UIF officials who might have been implicated in that TERS fraud. So 40 billion rand, Michael, 40 billion rand was set aside for this very function to support people. So uh, people who, who couldn't work. And yet we had a situation where there wasn't enough checks and balances to make sure that this money is not looted. Well, look, everything came together very, very quickly and rapidly at the end. So there wasn't enough time, according to the government, to make sure that everything was 100% foolproof. What we as the DA said right at the very beginning, we said, look, SARS has most of the information uh, that it needs anyway to make sure that these claims are processed and paid speedily. So why not hand over the job to SARS? We know that the UIF, the Unemployment Insurance Fund, has been bedeviled with problems right since the very beginning of its existence. So it was always going to be a very, very long shot for them to handle this mega project successfully. So we believe that SARS should have come in at the get-go. That unfortunately didn't happen. There were lots of hiccups along the way. As often happens in government, people saw this as an opportunity to uh, uh, advantage themselves. So there was a lot of fraud and corruption. And unfortunately, that's had very bad consequences for the ordinary man and woman in the street because they've battled to get money, which is rightfully theirs. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, it's just as something as simple as wanting to go get this benefit. It means for somebody, an ordinary person on the street, they're unable to put food on the table. Absolutely. If they don't get TERS payments, it's often the difference between them being able to pay their rent, being able to feed their children, um, being able to uh, buy school uniforms for their children. It has real life consequences. Yeah. And what's really been galling is that after the Auditor General's investigation, he found all this fraud and corruption at the UIF, the UIF's top brass was suspended on full pay. And they ended up spending about six or nine yeah. months at home, drawing their full salaries. And the double standard of that is really quite galling because I'm approached every day by hundreds of workers mm. who just haven't got their turs and they're mm. battling, you know, they're on the brink of disaster and collapse. Mm. And that has really been a, a very terrible situation mm. that many South Africans found themselves in. Sure. I want to bring in now, we've got, uh, as I said earlier, we've got a number of uh, Zoom guests that are here with us. Um, Osivu, who's an entrepreneur in Cape Town. Sivu, thank you so much for, for, for joining us. And I, I don't know, I mean, if you can, the, some of the, what Michael's been saying is, uh, quite, is, is quite chilling. Um, and if you can perhaps paint us a picture around some of your experience around running a business during this very difficult time. Thank you. So, um, look, I'll tell you what, it hasn't been easy. Um, you know, these restrictions have meant that we've had to keep reinventing and, re, uh, you know, innovating uh, con consistently. Um, and that, of course, has financial implications uh, and, and costs, which aren't always um, easy to recoup. Um, look, we, you know, my, 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 I have a quite a strong team and, um, you know, the guys have really hung in there. But already in February, already I had to change half my staff because other guys just, you know, they couldn't survive. Um, as you know, most of the, uh, of, of the staff in, in hospitality um, survive daily on tips mm -hmm. and not just their salaries. So, you know, uh, those days missed, those weeks missed, um, you know, impact them quite severely. Um, you know, look, we, you know, we've been lucky um, because we've had a lot of support from, you know, people in, in our industry, in our street. Um, you know, we, 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 we work hard. And, and I think also our, our community has really been, been, been um, great to us. Um, but every uh, uh, restriction, every time we went back an hour, um, we lost hundreds of thousands of rands. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, at, at this point, uh, we're just working to keep our staff and, and make sure that they're employed as opposed to, you know, running a business. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I mean, Sivu, you mentioned something as simple as, you know, like, you know, the, the change of lockdown, like uh, of, uh, of curfew, for instance. A lot of people, for instance, right at the beginning of, of the lockdown were saying, well, I mean, what does it matter um, that, you know, we shouldn't be on the streets after nine o'clock, whatever. Um, there's a pandemic anyway. But the reality is that it has real life consequences for somebody who runs a business when curfew has been moved. Mm. Well, look, I, I can't speak on on the uh, on the medical aspect of of of, of, of um, you know social restrictions, but I can certainly say that look, every hour does matter to us, um, mm -hmm. and you know it, it matters because you know you know we we we're, we're there to service people and provide them. You know, I think what we I think is a very valuable service. Um, you know, people need time off; they need time to relax. 
they need to eat, they need to drink, they need to socialize, right? Um, and, I, and I feel as if, you know, we, all of these things haven't really been taken into consideration. Uh, a blanket approach has been taken um, on, on everything. And this has really had a severe in, um, um, impact on, on, on our guys. Yeah. And speaking of uh, a blanket approach, and, and I, I really want to just quickly go back on that, Sivu, the blanket approach. I mean, a lot of people in the hospitality industry have been saying, look, bring us to the table. Let us tell you how our businesses work so that we can be able to say, look, this might work. This might not work. This is how we both keep what you're trying to do, government, going um, and also us trying to make a living and keep people employed. 100 percent. So, uh, look. I like to think of South Africans as very adaptable and, 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 and very innovative, for example. And I think that we haven't been given the opportunity to advance those, those, those abilities. You know, um, we've been left out of the conversation and uh, decisions keep being made on our behalf. And, and, you know, if you look at other countries and, and, and not even just other countries, I mean, um, you know, you, you look at other business, a lot of businesses have found ways to, 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 to curb and make it safer for, 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 for their, you know, their, their communities and their, um, their, their customers, but uh, these things aren't being taken into consideration. And and I think if 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 if, if government was looking closer into these things, we might find that we might be able to assist our entire industry mm. um, through innovation. But um, but none of these ideas are coming to the front, and and and, and nothing is is, is is being taken into consideration. I said. Yeah. Listen, I want to, I mean, it, you know, Michael, as, as Sivu says, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to Sivu just now. I mean, as, as Sivu says, I mean, there's an, he's talking about now his staff compliment and how he's now had to focus more on making, you know, keeping his people employed than even just, you know, running a business. And I know you get hundreds of complaints from people saying, we haven't received even that support. I've been let off work. What, what must I do now? Yeah. Well, the bottom line is that the relief measures haven't been enough. So there was much fanfare when President Ramaphosa announced last year this 500 billion rand economic stimulus package, and he promised various interventions. So there was an intervention to help small businesses, for example. But when the Auditor General audited exactly how much of the funds had been dispersed to small business, it was found that something like only 8% sure. of small businesses had received any of those relief funds. Then you had various other bizarre things. The tourism equity fund that was meant to help the tourism sector, for example, um, made its criteria racially restrictive. How can you say to people in the middle of a pandemic, you're not getting any government support because you're the wrong skin color? Yeah. My own personal dealings have been largely and specifically with TERS. Now, the UIF claims to have paid out in the region of 60 billion rand between April last year and the 15th of March this year, which may well be the case, but yeah. the fact is that a lot of people have battled to get that money. It's been a real struggle, and mm. so many obstacles have been put in, in the path of employers and employees in getting that money. Um, so, for example, when the lockdown was extended in December and January, and uh, large sections of the tourism and hospitality industry, including hotels, needed that money. Uh, it was a real mission for them to get it because a lot of them were told that actually you registered with the wrong um, sure. industrial classification code. So the bottom line is that lots of obstacles were put in their path. It's been made very difficult them, for them to access that money, which is rightfully theirs. You know, mm. employers and employees make contributions to the unemployment insurance fund and the money belongs to them. It's they deserve it. It's not a favor. It's not a favor. It's not a favor. It's not a privilege. Mm. It's their right to access those funds and they've had a hard time in doing so. Yeah. Tash, I know that, you know, in your family, just like, um, uh, you know, Sivu was talking now, you know, you've got, a, 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 your, you've got experience in the hospitality industry. And I know that you've had massive difficulties. Absolutely. I, I mean, my brother runs a, a chain of restaurants called 40 after his name. And uh, he's had to access his mortgage because he's always said, and this is a, my late father always used to teach us this, your greatest asset in the restaurant is your staff. It's not your fancy restaurant restaurant, your staff are your asset because as they grow, they develop relationships with yourself, with your customers. Um, so your staff are everything. Mm -hmm. They are the asset to the restaurant. So my brother has done everything he can to keep um, paying his staff at their full salaries. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of him for that. What's interesting, Michael, is that um, organizations have still come 
to bother restaurateurs at the height of their of their hardship. People like the bargaining council mm. barging mm. into the restaurant and trying to make uh, people pay bargaining council mm. things. Now, my brother's six foot eight, and I wouldn't certainly wouldn't mess with him. And he <laughs> greatly he took great pleasure in throwing them out. Mm. But I mean, at a time like this, imagine someone coming into your restaurant when you're already accessing your bond to pay your staff, and a government institution wants to make it even more difficult for you. I, I'm of the opinion, and not just because I'm a child of restaurateurs, mm. but I mean, I support Cebu like, greatly, mm. and I actually feel that it's a, my social responsibility to to help restaurants yeah. because I know the chain. Th there's a chain mm. that we forget about in restaurants. There's suppliers. There's wine suppliers. There's sure. vegetable suppliers. There's meat suppliers. So it's not just the restaurant. The no. restaurant has a whole knock-on effect. Um, so by supporting our restaurants and supporting the takeout and making it a, sort of a little bit easier for restaurants to keep operating, we're not just looking after the restaurants, we're looking after a whole chain uh, that could be devastated yeah. if this lockdown continues the way. And I salute restaurateurs like Cebu and like Forti, yeah. who have done everything they can to keep their staff safe and to make sure that their suppliers remain able to keep in business. Yeah. Cebu, just to, to, to wrap up with you uh, uh, on, this, on this issue, I mean, you know, hopefully as things will ease up and you'll be able to operate again. And, you know, I'm sure you would want, you know, people in Cape Town and in, in the, the place, the people that you serve to try and support you as much as possible, because it's not just about running a business, right? It's also just about keeping your staff employed and making sure that they get to put food on the table for their families. Mm -hmm. What's the question? So the question is, I mean, is, is that that is probably what you would want to do. You would want you would want to encourage people to support local businesses, not just yours, but ones in, in oh, Cape Town and all around. Yeah, look, one hundred percent. Look, I, I, I think you know uh, the, 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 the the value we add uh, to, to, to 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 Cape Town as a city, to, to tourism, and 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 vast other things. Uh, is, is is immense, and and you know where people can support us. I mean, we we, we urge them to support us. Um, you know, uh, you know, if it's donations or, or whatever the case may be. You know, um, you know, if we can keep these guys employed for um, until we can get past this this difficult time. Uh, you know, please, I I urge you guys to, to dig deep. But I also understand that uh, we, you know we're all in, in this together. Everybody is is, is struggling and suffering. So, you know, we're not asking you to do too much. We're just asking you to do what little you can just to keep us there so that we can, you know, we can be there for you too when, uh, when the time comes. Yeah. No, thank you very much. And, uh, and, and, and I'm really, really hoping that we can see an easing of these regulations so that we can see people get back to work. Um, Dean, I want to move over to you now because I know that you've been incredibly vocal about the effectiveness of lockdown versus what government has been able to do uh, or not not be able to do in terms of vaccinations and how it's been absolutely destructive? Well, so first of all, uh, lockdowns are generally designed by people that have no idea how to run a business, have never employed anyone before. Uh, and so it's all just a theoretical exercise to them. They have no idea about the devastating consequences that it has for uh, livelihoods. Um, and I think that also the legitimacy now of lockdowns are really in question after the chaotic circus scenes that we saw in Nkandla this weekend, mm. that uh, if you are a restaurateur or you own a bar or you are a gogo in a sasuku, they will not hesitate the police to uh, water cannon you, arrest you, throw you in the back of a paddy wagon and, uh, and, and lock you up. But if you're Jacob Zuma and you're an armed ANC supporter, you can do whatever the hell you want and you can completely get away with it. So, you know, I think that really the argument and the idea of lives and livelihoods have really been thrown out by government because we were told that we needed to have the initial lockdown in March last year to prepare the healthcare system. And for 15 months, they've lied to us and have not prepared the healthcare system. They couldn't even reopen the hospital in Johannesburg, uh, 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 which they said they were doing a week after two months. So really, I think that the social contract between uh, the public and government is in tatters. And all the while, the president is hiding in a bunker, and we have no idea where exactly he is at the moment. And he refuses to say anything 
about what is happening uh, in the country at the moment. Yeah. I mean, Dean, the hospitality industry, I mean, in fact, before I, I go there, I mean, Tash, I mean, the scenes that we saw in KwaZulu Natal, I think, this weekend, as Dean says, it's now threatening the social contract between what government says people must do versus what people in the ANC can do. I mean, nobody, the, the, the organizers of that march have or, or the gathering have not been arrested. People just kind of did whatever they wa they wanted. So if I, I was at the march, the restaurateurs march in Cape Town, where they very peacefully and very cleverly use their brooms to keep social distance. Mm. And I watched them being water cannon to the point that they, they called me from the office and I ran downstairs and I was willing to be arrested because that's what you do, right? Because mm. you're, you're a normal human mm -hmm. being. You protect other human beings. And I watched the police specifically turn their water cannon on Truth Cafe, mm. where they were were breaking no law whatsoever. They were having a peaceful protest outside. And Dean is so right. You're attacking peaceful protesters for doing absolutely nothing wrong. But then in Nkandla, um, for some reason, I mean, I think we all know what that reason is, and I'm being terribly politically mm -hmm. correct, but we're having a gathering that is armed, that is dangerous, and that is a COVID mass spreader. Yeah. And our police minister is nowhere to be found. Uh, the president has not come out and said anything. And in fact, Jesse Duarte comes out and says, we love Zuma and we'll do anything yeah. to keep him out of jail. Yeah. How is that supposed mm. to make your average South African and especially a South African business person feel yeah. at a time like this. Somebody who has absolutely nothing, no, no, you know, no food to put on the table and uh, and, and, and the President Ramaphosa is missing. Dean, I want to come back to you uh, with, with regards to the hospitality industry. I mean, you've dealt with them quite a bit. They, it is a massive employer um, that now has had to deal with these the, the impact of these lockdowns. Absolutely. I mean, just in hotels and restaurants, bars, you're looking at 500, 600, 700,000 people. Uh, that's just directly. And then uh, I think, uh, as uh, Sivo spoke about, you've got uh, everyone else that contributes uh, to that. Natasha also spoke about that. So it's not a small industry. And these people, you know, l rely on gratuity uh, from patrons uh, to, to survive. If they're not working, they're not earning. And it seems completely astonishing to me that government that uh, has an unemployment rate of over 40 percent, restaurants employ a lot of young people, 74 percent of them are unemployed. When we are in an economic uh, and unemployment crisis, we're telling people to stay at home and not work. I mean, who does that? Where's the logic in that? And that's why I go back to my earlier points of view, that literally these regulations continuously are drawn up by people that have never employed a person in their life. They've never paid a, a, a PAYE, they've never paid UIF. They have no idea the costs and the capital that go into business because only people who don't have any idea of that could draw these regulations up and instruct morons to come into your restaurant to start uh, harassing you about bargaining council regulations. Uh, and, and that's really, I mean, it's it's like a circus at the moment in government. And that's why, you know, I think that uh, in my personal view, these uh, regulations are draconian. They're overboard. They uh, We were told that the lockdown regulations were going to be uh, uh, more uh, location specific and provincial uh, based. And yet we just continue with blanket uh, approaches to everywhere. I mean, there is a... Uh, uh, there's no surge in the Northern Cape. Why should they be uh, subjected to the same uh, rules as, uh, as, as, as Gauteng? And I call it collective COVID. That's the problem, is that government cannot differentiate between everybody suffering uh, and, and applying rules in a fair and even-handed manner. Mm. And, and I mean, Dean, from, in your view, do you think, I mean, if we've got this continued, um, you know, lockdown, these continued lockdown restrictions, can industries like this ever recover? Well, I mean, Sibyl's right. South Africans are very resilient, but they're resilient to a point. Now, I mean, what person really would ever consider opening up a, a hospitality uh, um, uh, establishment going forward. We've been through four alcohol bans. Yeah. Um, they can just, uh, you know, ban liquor at the drop of a hat. And, uh, you know, Vinpro 
is in court this morning and we say all strength to them because, you know, what business needs, small and large, is certainty. It needs to understand the field that it's playing on. But if you keep shifting the goalposts and if you keep making announcement with zero consultation, and that's actually what happened in the uh, in the last uh, regulations that were announced, there was no consultation. Nobody knew what was coming. Uh, I mean, just look at the unprecedented move that Comair has had to take. They're in business rescue. They've grounded all their planes until the end of the month. Uh, now, I was supposed to be in studio today, but it would have taken me three days to do a trip that would have taken me four hours because mm. there are, there's just one flight a day between Durban and Cape Town. We can't operate like that. And the president is cutting the economy at its knees uh, with these continued uh, regulations and the way in which they are being implemented and the lack of consultation in which they take place. Absolutely, especially considering the fact that we are still lagging so behind with our targets of vaccinating people. Because then if you are not vaccinating people and locking people down, then it means that we are going to be stuck in a perpetual lockdown uh, to the point where the, the industries like this can't recover. Well, the only way out of this is vaccines, vaccines and vaccines. And, you know, we must apportion blame where, uh, where we need to. The fact of the matter is, is that the president is the commander in chief. He's the head of South Africa Incorporated. And he was asleep at the wheel while many other countries and many of our peers uh, were ordering vaccines. We were banning cooked chickens. We were telling people what they could buy. Uh, it was absurdity. That's what the entire government's focus was on. And we are paying the real price for that. And there's an economic and a personal price to pay. Yeah. And people are paying with their lives. And the government simply cannot get away with it. Yeah. And so we need to do everything that we can. We need to decentralize the procurement of vaccines. We need to hand this over to the private sector. It's very clear that the state has no capacity uh, they cannot keep the lights on. Why anyone thinks that they can administer vaccines is beyond me. They need to get as many hands on deck as possible, and we need to get this going. Because the truth of the matter is, to be with, this is costing our economy billions and billions of rands. Just the first four alcohol bans cost our economy 30 billion rand in taxes. Sure. We went and bought, borrowed 70 billion rand from the IMF. We could have avoided half of that loan if we hadn't gone down that extreme measure. So there are always consequences for these yeah. decisions uh, and, and they are proving to be dire at the moment. Yeah, and they're not just macro decisions, they also just affect ordinary people on the street. Martin, I want to bring you in here. Uh, Martin is a constitutional law and public law expert and I want to talk about, I mean, we've now had a, a conversation about lockdowns, their shortcomings, but I want to talk more about the legality around either the imposition of the Disaster Management Act or generally some of these lockdown regulations. Yeah, no, thanks, Sabir. Uh, South African rights have not been invaded to this extent, uh, arguably since the 1980s of the states of emergency of those years. Uh, during the first hard lockdown, our right to freedom of movement was almost completely suspended, which is impermissible under a, a state of disaster. Uh, and I mean, we've now uh, talked about the commercial freedom of many businesses that, uh, especially those that at the beginning were arbitrarily designated as non-essential, uh, as if that's a thing. Uh, and then, uh, uh, one of our most important constitutional rights, the right to human dignity uh, of employees who uh, uh, work at open door, uh, uh, open air restaurants. There is virtually zero chance of COVID spreading there, but they are now forced to, to stay home and not receive their money. Mm -hmm. Patients in hospitals uh, cannot see friends and family, terminal patients, or are having a hard time seeing friends and family at their, in their last moments. Their right to human dignity has been destroyed. Now, all of this has ha and more has happened without satisfying the requirements of Section 36.1 of Constitution, which re which sets out how government may limit our rights in situations such as this, specifically a limitation. Uh, uh, if a limitation is overbroad, like banning open air restaurants 
or if there are less restrictive means available to government rather than the limitation like vaccinations, uh, then that limitation will be unconstitutional. Now, I think if we look at most lockdown regulations, we will find that they are mm-hmm. overbroad and that government could have done something else that is less invasive. Mm-hmm. Now, I think all constitutionalists in South Africa uh, should be very concerned about the unilateral fashion in which our rights have been set aside on the whim of a few ministers. Parliament didn't set them aside. The president didn't set them aside. These are just regulations written in smoke-free rooms in the basements of Pretoria. Now, it shows that our constitutional democracy is still very fragile and requires a very strong civil society that can stand up to government dictates of this nature. Absolutely. I mean, Martin, what would you say if somebody said, well, look, I mean, you know, in the interest of saving lives, let's suspend, you know, a couple of freedoms here and there. It's all in the broader interest of of saving lives. But there's obviously a risk here and it's a slippery slope. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we have a constitutional democracy. The Constitution tells us in very minute detail how government can go about uh, implementing something like this. And it must satisfy those requirements in Section 36.1 and other uh, safeguards like parliamentary oversight, access to the courts. Uh, Now, an argument can be made that sometimes extreme measures have to be taken, but they cannot be arbitrary. You cannot tell an open air restaurant where people sit four meters from one another another that you now have to be closed and you all have to go home and stay inside your houses where there is worse ventilation than, than being at the restaurant. Uh, that's arbitrary. That's nonsense. That mm-hmm. that cannot be said we're saving their lives by taking away their livelihoods. Uh, uh, that's simply, um, uh, as Dean mentioned, something that someone does who, who doesn't understand business. Uh, uh, even uh, closed door restaurants with proper ventilation are, are relatively safe if, if certain measures are taken. Uh, so there is no linkage between the reality on the ground and the, the total theoretical uh, nonsense that our government is following uh, through now, which, which really is decimating our economy and really decimating our constitutional democracy. And, and should we be worried, Martin? I mean, and I asked Natasha this right at the beginning. I mean, should we be worried with this extension of a state of disaster when, you know, it's quite clear the way in which the, the legislation was drafted, that it was always intended to be a, for a short period of time so that we can get to a point where you're not in a state of disaster. But I mean, it's been 15 months and uh, with just a quick government gazette that signed, you know, we just you know, willingly accept that we have suspended some of the provisions of our constitution. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a huge problem. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the the more direct implications of this are the police and military brutality that we've seen, uh, the looting and the corruption. Uh, I mean, uh, the the smoking ban and the alcohol ban during the hard lockdown last year. About a hundred African diplomats were suspended in South Africa uh, a month ago because they were engaged in the illegal alcohol trade, and this was only enabled because we had that lockdown in the first place. I don't even have to mention the economic implications. Uh, uh, Civil uh, said something about his own business. Natasha said something about her brother's business. Thousands of small businesses are closed down, and there are untold additional numbers of people who are now unemployed. Uh, but I think the most sinister consequence of this uh, uh, ad infinitum uh, lockdown is an indirect one, and that is on our collective uh, Primary, or primarily our political culture. Mm. A lot of South Africans have now simply accepted government's lockdown measures. Mm. Uh, and, and this is the biggest explosion in government power that we've seen since we've adopted the constitution. Uh, and it hasn't been done through legislation. It's been done through hip-fired ministerial regulations. If our political culture is so accepting of uh, uh, what can only be described really as, as authoritarianism, then uh, it baffles the imagination what government Government can do in the future in response to other uh, uh, things that it describes as a disaster. Uh, what what rights could it simply set aside then? It, it, it really is a slippery slope, and that is why we need to insist that, listen, the Constitution is specific about when rights may be limited, and we have to stick to that, even though it might sometimes feel uncomfortable. Absolutely. And I mean, for me, and then as you say, I mean, it, it impacts the political culture in the country because, you know, now we, you know, uh, we speak about having a family meeting every, once in a while and we get told what not to do and, you know, how we need to stay at home and uh, whether or not we can buy chicken or walk around in shorts. I mean, the, the reality is that what Martin is saying, Natasha, is that firstly, Parliament has been relegated to just being 
you know, the, uh, an entity that needs to be pacified. But at the same time, I mean, the political culture in South Africa is becoming that of accepting that it's okay for government to tell you what to do. So let me tell you what irritates me the most is that we call these family meetings, and I hate that term, family meetings, because in my in my book, and I think in the book of most South Africans, families look after each other. Mm. Let's call it what it is. It's the president calling us together to shout at us. Mm. Because I haven't been to one of these so-called family meetings where the president has taken responsibility yeah. for himself or the actions of his ministers. Everything has been our fault. We haven't obeyed the COVID regulations. We haven't washed our hands properly. And it goes even further to something so ridiculous like... Um, the minister in Kosozana Glamini Zuma telling us that when we zool, we put saliva on the paper. Well, let me tell you what I saw. I saw people buying cigarettes for 500 rand a box of cigarettes. Mm. And because they were so expensive, one cigarette was being passed around 10 people so that everyone could have a puff of that cigarette, mm. which would not have happened if she just left cigarettes alone. Because People are not children. Mm. And this government needs to learn that we are not a nanny state. We are respectable, responsible human beings. Yeah. And we know what we are doing. To a degree, we are also responsible for our own health. Absolutely. So I think that the president should stop telling us how to wash our hands and start coming on TV on a Sunday night and telling us the actions that he's going to take against a health minister who has been found guilty of a, a, a very dubious action regarding PPE mm. and certainly tell us that his prime minister is being fired with immediate effect because she continuously seeks to become president even though she wasn't duly elected president. Yeah. yeah. And, and Michael, I mean, I want to bring you in here, you know, as we've all now had this discussion and it's painted quite a grim picture. The reality is that we're not making enough jobs. We're bleeding jobs. Some of these industries may or may never, you know, may never recover. You know, what, what do we say to people about what are some of the things that we would want to do to kind of kickstart and resuscitate our economy at this point. That's true, Siv. One of the key points to make is that South Africa's had an unemployment crisis uh, for decades. So government likes to say we're losing jobs because of COVID. Well, that's not entirely true. The fact is we have an unemployment crisis that spans decades of ANC rule. And the reasons for that crisis are deep-seated and they are structural. So what needs to happen is a whole series of reforms. What do you need in order to create jobs? Well, you need investment in your economy and you need economic growth. Mm -hmm. That helps to create an environment in which private sector companies will create jobs. Unfortunately, what's happening under this government is that they are doing everything in their power to deter investment and to strangle economic growth. If you look at the big picture uh, developments around expropriation without compensation, yeah. if you look at national health insurance, if you look at the various developments around the mining charter, this is these things are all sending an incredibly negative message to investors. We don't want your money. It's not politically safe and secure and stable in South Africa to bring you money in. Yeah. So it's deterring and repelling investors. We're not getting economic growth. We're not getting jobs. So what we need to do as a matter of absolute urgency is to take expropriation without compensation off the table. We need to take all those other big ticket uh, policy moves that deter investment and strangle economic growth off the table. And we also need to embark on a purposeful set of labor market reforms. So Natasha was speaking earlier about the bargaining councils yeah. interfering in the restaurant industry at the worst possible time. The fact is that these bargaining council agreements are extended to small firms that simply can't comply with them. It's, it's, it's administratively onerous, and the effect is that they stop hiring workers. So we need to make sure that these collective bargaining agreements don't apply that they are not extended to small, small and new firms. And then, of course, we have a massive youth unemployment crisis, yeah. and we need to find ways of addressing that. The expansion of a proper youth wage subsidy is one thing, and, of course, there's a whole schools and education aspect to it which needs to be seriously addressed too. So, obviously, I mean, you know, this is also, you know, COVID is being used as a fig leaf to say, well, the reason why there's unemployment is because actually it's because of COVID. But actually what we are doing is we're sitting in, you know, structurally 
completely messed up economy and that's why we haven't been able to make to make great jobs for the longest time. Absolutely. The unemployment crisis in South Africa has been a ticking time bomb for years. Sure. Yes, COVID has worsened the situation. Yes, lockdown has aggravated the situation. It's led to a lot of churn in the labor market at one stage. During the first tranche of lockdowns last year, some two million people lost their jobs. We've had some jobs recovery, but the fact is we are not growing the economy fast enough mm. to create sufficient jobs to absorb a large amount of people into the labor force. And that's what we need to look at, yeah. to focus on and to tackle. Natasha, finally, on your side, what are we going to be doing to essentially hold people accountable for the mess that has been our vaccine rollout, some of these, um, you know, structural issues that Michael talks about? Well, so expect a lot of uh, whining, um, <laughs> a lot of whining. <laughs> Uh, the coroner of South Africa is coming out full force. <laughs> I am going uh, full on to make sure that Parliament uh, reconvenes as quickly as we possibly can to, to make sure that we have portfolio committees dealing with these issues. Um, we can do it in a safe way. We've taught Parliament how to run in a, in a COVID safe environment. Yeah. Talking about adap adaptable, I mean, we've yeah. been completely adaptable. Um, we're sending messages through people like Michael and Dean um, to government where the government just can't back away from the logic that Michael and Dean present to the mm -hmm. government. We are sending government our recovery plans, which I think is terribly important. And we are working with civil society and the hospitality industry mm -hmm. to help them where we possibly can. And we're going to continue that. Yeah. But from Parliament's side, we are pushing for absolute accountability and we are throwing the kitchen sink mm -hmm. at everything we possibly can. So um, the whining is going to be um, of extraordinary proportions, but the government will take note and the government will listen. And it's time to stop treating the people like mushrooms yeah. and bring us into the light and start treating us like responsible adults. The government certainly can't handle the situation. Guess what? South Africa is handling the situation despite yeah. and in spite of what the government has tried to do to them. And that's a strong message we need to send to the government. The people are taking the power back. Absolutely. And of course, and as the official opposition, it's absolutely our job to make sure that we are still there for people that are fighting for the little person who's just trying to make a living. We'll be back after this. cities across the country. The DA-led Western Cape has partnered with Golden Arrow to launch South Africa's first electric buses. DA-led Kucha powers 200 new homes in Moy Eitzig and is fast-tracking 200 more. Power to the people. And DA-led Nelson Mandela Bay fixes over 11,000 leaks to help save water during the drought. Keep it going. The DA gets things done. Now, on to this week's DA to Work feature, we chat to Grant Twig, the City of Cape Town's MACO member for Urban Management, about the innovative Urban Gardens project his team is spearheading to support food security in communities. Grant, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I really want to get stuck into this. We've just had a whole discussion about the grim reality of lockdown. And now the city is doing such an incredible project around the Urban Garden Initiative. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about it. Yes, we were. Thank you for, for having me. Um, when we were hit with COVID, um, the city of Cape Town was very proactive. Mm. 
we started off by feeding people in soup kitchens and all of that. We were criticized, um, but only to realize that that was the right thing to do. Um, and then the mayor said, look, that's not going to be sustainable. Let's look at other ways of actually dealing with um, how to support our communities. Um, and then we started, you know, thinking out of the box. And one of the things that we found is that in different uh, communities within Cape Town, people were already busy mm. um, growing uh, vegetables and so on. And we then latched onto that to say, how do we support our communities in becoming in becoming sustainable and putting food on the table? Yeah, because of course, like as you say, like many families were struggling to make ends meet. So this is a, literally a matter of making sure we capacitate people so that they can do it for themselves. Yes. So so what we what we've now done is we put budget to it. Okay. Um, and we've uh, set out, we've got 24 sub-councils within the city of Cape Town. And our first target is to have 30 uh, urban farms okay. within a sub-council, then bringing it to 720. And that's our target for the first year, yeah. in having 720 urban farmers that we'd be able to support. So tell me, I mean, Grant, so so if we if the target is about 30 urban farms per sub council, I mean, in, in terms of impact, how many people does that even include? I mean, how many people are you essentially empowering? Look, it's, if you look at it, it's one family. Our, our intention is to start with a family that actually is going to grow the garden. Mm. And that family, if you take on average, it's about... 10 to 12 people mm. and then if you calculate that yeah. and looking in the streets and looking in the, at the sub council in the wards it's actually to grow for that community mm. um, so our intention is to um, we haven't done a calculation but I yeah. can think it's going to be a lot of food um, that we'll be able to support yeah. our communities and of course it's also about giving people the skills yes part of and that's 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 the nice thing about it because part of the program is to work in skills so we've got training We've got a, a, a support base where we've got a service provider that's going to do training um, and then have that skills transferred not only to those farmers, but also see how we can integrate and bring in more farmers as we go forward. Yeah. And the thing is, as you say, you know, the, the city, the reality is that people, you know, we were now in this really, you know, in this crisis, but the city didn't say, oh, well, you know, there's nothing we can do. We were like, well, you were like, let's just jump in and see how we can give people the best chance of survival. Look, what the city has done, and here again, the city of Cape Town councillors Came to the party mm. because what they've done is they've prioritized their budgets um, and instead of putting an extra uh, uh, sp uh, sport equipment on a sports field yeah. they, they took that money and put it into this urban farming project so that we can actually take that out to the community yeah. and it's incredible grant because i think a lot of people in south africa say you know people don't want to farm people just want money but now here are people doing it for themselves keeping healthy but also getting this much needed support from government. What we've realized is that a lot of people want to do things for themselves. Mm. They just need the support and through this program, and I'm very excited about it mm. because through this program, you could actually see people coming and putting up their hand and say, I want to be part of that. Mm. Um, so looking at the 720, in fact, there's more people every day coming and saying, we want to be part of this. Okay. Um, so what we've already done for the new financial year is looking at how do we... Uh, put additional budget okay. in moving forward. Yeah, and uh, and you say and you it's it's budgets that have been reprioritized so that you can essentially make sure that it's it, you know you you beefen it up and you expand it. Yes, yes. I think I think one of the things that the councillors has also done is explain to community members how they've reprioritized that. Mm -hmm. um, so. Tomorrow, if you see there's one less equipment on the park, yeah. you'd understand why. Yeah. Because that money is gone to feed um, that community. Mm. Um, so, yeah. And, 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 I mean, and Grant, I mean, this is something that we've been talking about quite a lot, about how the DA gets things done. It, it, what is the difference here? What is the, the, the DA difference in a situation like this where you are a, and a municipality is able to step into the breach where people have really literally been plunged into unemployment and poverty? What do you think sets us apart from other municipalities to be able to do this? I think you touched on it. It's the DA difference because one thing that we've done, we've not waited 
um, that communities must go and stand in lines for the 350 rand that government was supposed to give. Because yeah. still today, not everybody's uh, received that. What we did is ac actually saying how we're going to support our communities. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we were criticized in the beginning for giving out uh, to soup kitchens and feeding people, mm -hmm. um, only to realize that we were doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And with this project, again, it's showing that where the DA governs, we actually want to take hands with our community. Yeah. We want to support our community, and this program is one of those. And you know, there's nothing that inspires me more when you say people actually want to do things. And so this place is also about empowering them and giving them skills yes. so that they can do it for themselves. Absolutely, because there's no way that we, if we look at the current setup in agriculture, mm. our farmers are not able to do everything. Mm. Um, but here we have uh, community members that are saying we want to be part of not only rebuilding uh, the economy, but also looking after ourselves. Yeah. So the, 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 the urban farmer would be able to put food on the table, but also to support a community. Because people don't just want handouts. Yes, They absolutely. want to be able to lift themselves absolutely, out of poverty. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is some really incredible work and it's so exciting. And, I, and I'm really hoping that we can see it being expanded and blown up. Look, that is, indeed, that is the intention because it's not only keeping it at... Uh, people feeding themselves, but it's to start co-ops. And the city is going to support the urban farmers with that yeah. because we're looking at how do we how do we create markets in a community? Yeah. How do we create co-ops so that we can actually take it further? And the intention is not to have the farmer stay in his backyard. It's also to look at how do we can get, how, how, how do we get additional land mm. so that we can actually grow more? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing and uh, strength to your arm and your team for this incredible work. Oh, thank you very much. We'll be back after this. We are in the middle of a third wave of infections, a variant that experts claim is extremely infectious. Let's continue to mask up and keep our distance and stay at home where possible. I want to appeal to you to support local and small businesses where you can. Every job we can help retain is one more household that can put food on the table. To those who have hung on to their small businesses and helped support their employees during this time, we see you and we will continue to fight for you. Until next time, keep it tight, Mzansi.